my name is Sean Fawcett, and we're the Workplace Learning Coordinators on campus. I saw you like, or two weeks ago, um, where I was presenting to your class. Um, but today's here, we have our wonderful uh, career panel for you. Um, so just a couple housekeeping items before we get started. Um, there is a sign-in sheet that's going around, so please make sure to sign in. Uh, and make sure to write legibly uh, with your name, your student ID, and then also your email address. Uh, we'll use that for attendance today for your professor, but also um, we'll put that um, for our work-based learning listserv. So any uh, events that we have on campus related to career, uh, we'll make sure to notify you via email. Um, a couple other things. You have um, a flyer that's going around um, with our employer panel, our, their bios. So that way you can learn a little bit more about them, their background, their education, etc. Um, but you'll hear plenty from them today as well as their experiences and advice. And at the end of our panel, we'll just ask that you complete a short survey, so that way we can get your feedback on what you learned today um, and any um, suggestions for improvement for future career panels that we um, do with students and work-based learning activities. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to your classmates, uh, and they are going to moderate your panel for you. Thank you. Oh, sure. So my name is Liv, or Olivia, whichever you prefer. Um, I'm the registration coordinator for Southern California Christian Writers Conference, and my major is business administration. Um, Hi, I'm Taylor. My major is kinesiology. My special title is I'm an athlete. I run track. <laughs> <laughs> also, he works at Domino's. I work at Pizza Hut, so not sure this is going to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'd love to hear introductions from you guys. Um, your name, job title, company, education, background, and a brief intro about yourself. Sure, yeah. I'm Jennifer Bauer. I'm the Vice President of Stadium Partnerships with Legends. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Legends, Legends is a company owned by the Yankees and the Cowboys. They come into new stadiums and they handle naming rights and founding partnerships as well as selling premium hospitality. Um, I'm originally from Canada, actually a track runner at San Diego State. Which is how I got down here. I've been here for close to 20 years. Had a variety of roles within sports. I also did a 10-year stint at the Chargers, where I ever saw their corporate partnership fulfillment side. So I work in sports in the business of sports marketing. Um, my degree was in business management or business with an emphasis in management. Um, and I've done a variety of internships throughout my career as well. Um, but again, I'm excited to be here and happy to answer any questions you guys may have. I'm Philippe Andrews. Um, I'm a wildlife biologist. I work for the Institute for Wildlife Studies, which is a nonprofit organization. Our main office, we have one in San Diego and one up to actually in Humboldt County and a couple on the Channel Islands. Um, I actually got in this career working um, as a kid. You know, I'm, I grew up as a cowboy, so roping, riding horses and stuff, breaking them, and that's how I got in my field. Um, I've been in this field for about eight years. I started with internships through Student Conservation Association and Geo Course of America and I've worked all over the country, mainly in the West, so Grand Canyon, Alaska, um, out here in California, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, uh, Illinois, and in addition to that, uh, I travel the state and all the Channel Islands, so I do a lot of mountain lion research and I put GPS collars and satellite collars on them as well, I take blood work for genetics and DNA, and um, we're trying to expand our nonprofit company, so it's working pretty well. We do have a lot of ongoing projects that we get on. Um, we're always looking for new folks. So if anyone is interested in volunteering and whatnot, you can definitely sign a waiver for that <laughs> for certain certain uh, projects. <laughs> but uh, yeah, worked on all wildlife species from brown bears, grizzly bears, black bears, moose, elk, wolves. So you name it all across the board. Cool. My name is Marie. I am the Director of Operations and Marketing with a nonprofit called Traveling Stories. Weird, I was going to say traveling agency. Um, we don't travel. We, the kids come to us, they, they come to us to fall in love with reading. Um, how I landed here is kind of quite an interesting story. In Canada, I'm from Canada as well. Um, back home, I used to organize huge events and festivals like carnivals that drew in one million people. They were humongous events. And I fell in love with a guy who was a race car mechanic and he said, why don't you join my team? And I figured, I don't even know the difference between an impact wrench and a drill, so why not? Um, <laughs> so I became, I became a car chief on a race car team. It's a sprint car operation. We raced about 100 times a year. I did that for seven years, which got me to go to every single state in, in the country. Um, not very many Americans have done that, especially not a Canadian. Um, 
And then when we lost our sponsorship, we were we had a you know national sponsorship with Owens Corning. We kind of just headed south and landed here in San Diego. Bought a boat, lived on a boat. Um, quite fun for four years. Where I got to play roller derby. I organized all of our derby bouts, and then I ended up living pretty much two years in Mexico on different anchorages. Um, and now I'm just grounding myself. I'm here with with traveling stories. I worked as uh, chief of operations for a marketing agency, got tired of making sure lawyers stayed rich, and now I'm back with the nonprofit world, where I get to feel like I'm giving back to the community and my life has a little bit more meaning. Hi, I'm Dr. Lucilia Portella, or Lucy for short. I'm a pediatric physical therapist at Family Health Centers in San Diego. I've been practicing for over 20 years. I absolutely love, love, love working with kids. Um, the beauty of being a physical therapist is there's a huge gamut of pop patient population that you can work with, and I've done it a little bit of everything. I've worked in hospitals and orthopedics and outpatient clinics and nursing homes and um, private home visits. Um, but my passion was always with kids. Um, so when I moved to San Diego, I made sure I got a, a job working with kids from zero to 13 years old. Um, these children present with delays in their gross motor skills. Um, children with diagnoses such as Down syndrome and, and cerebral palsy and um, neurological disorders like that. Um, I speak Spanish and Portuguese, so that's a huge asset in San Diego. Um, and, what else? and I'm a new mom with a six month old, so it's really great to see a, a typical development from, you know, mother's eyes, having the knowledge that I have, so it's great. Awesome. Can you guys describe your day-to-day -day responsibilities and your field? Sure, yeah, I guess I'll start. Um, I'm relatively new in this role, <laughs> so it's been three weeks. Um, but my day-to-day -day responsibilities right now is a lot of strategy. And for those of you guys who have forgotten the introduction, um, what stadium I'm actually working on, but it's the new Aztec Stadium. So if you've been following the news, San Diego State's in the process of purchasing 132 acres from the city and tearing down current SCCCU and building a new stadium. So that will be the stadium that I'm actually selling. So we don't even own the land yet, so right now it's a lot of strategy in terms of brands we would go after, what the value of the naming rights would be, brands we would go after for founding partnerships. I'm also hiring a team. I have two people that I will be hiring. So just in the process of kind of setting everything up for to go out there and actually sell once we own the land and once we have a little bit more details onto what we can actually sell. So I guess that's my day to day is strategy. All right, uh, my day-to-day -day strategy, uh, it's, it's, it varies. It's pretty open. Uh, sometimes I can get caught up randomly. We have a, I actually have another cell phone for work. So it's a live feed for some traps we'll set up for mountain lions in Northern California, like Modoc County and all that, and Humboldt County. And next thing I know, I have to fly up within two hours, three hours. So um, sometimes that happens, and then I meet up. I have a crew that's ready. They'll meet me out there, pick me up from the airport. Uh, otherwise, when I'm in San Diego, I have, a, I have two offices, so one's downtown and the other one's off Old Sea Road Drive. So I also do avian research, and then sometimes I fly out to the Channel Islands, and I'll do avian research, some bird banding and whatnot, and also work on foxes. You know, it all depends, at least in my career path, or my career at least. Um, it varies. I mean, it can change any second, so you could be relaxing one day, and next thing you know, you get a call or you see something, and... Boom, you have to be ready, right on the dot, ready to go. So you always have to be prepared. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I don't think there is a typical day. And I, I don't know, for those who are into variety, that's like such a draw. There is never a day that's the same as the previous one. Um, the only thing that they have in common is they all end in a Y. Um, my day two. <laughs> um, so like my days I'll, I'll make sure that there's no, there's no uh, that our website hasn't crashed so I'll go in and look at our website I'll update our plugins, I'll look at our standings, I kind of you know as because my job half is marketing director and half is operations director so in terms of marketing I want to make sure the website is still alive, it's still okay, it's functioning, the plugins are all up to date, there's nothing that needs to be done there 
and then I'll look at our website where all of our donations come in. So I got to go and check in and see if there are any recent donations. If there are, then I'll call them and thank them. I'll write them a personalized card. Um, I'll get the whole team to sign it up. Um, and then I also manage our info at, which is just the bucket of all the emails that come in. So I'll go in there and, and redirect it. Recently, I created an autoresponder so that anyone who you know, writes there, they get an autoresponder email with all the basic information. Um, I'll follow up on general emails. I'll go and see if there's any voicemail on the phone and, and follow up on those. So all that is just sort of like the daily you know, get in there. Um, I might be launching new campaigns. Oh, little baby. <laughs> Um, designing all the assets, so I'll go and, and, and design um, maybe social media posting or posters or flyers. Um, I'll answer any last minute rush jobs that the board of directors might want us to handle. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's a variety. We just finished organizing our annual gala, a fundraising gala, and I was pretty much in charge of that, so that was a lot of, a lot of, um, Oh, managing all of the people wanting to buy tickets, managing all the donations, managing the donors, um, making baskets that people can bid on, and then following up on that. So it's such a variety of things. If if you like the an all above kind of job, that's that's my job. My family strategy is to play. <laughs> I play all day long with children. Um, you know, you always have a plan of what you're going to do with a child um, based on your assessment, what the goals are for each child. Uh, day to day, I would have I will have anywhere from eight to ten patients a day, um, and that includes treating, daily treatment, or evaluating. So an evaluation will take place um, in the clinic with a parent present based on the problem, whatever the problem is reported by, by the parent. And then I'll assess the, the patient, and then I come up with different strategies in order to address their goals. And it's all play-based, everything. So you just have to be super creative in the activities that you're gonna do to be able to target the muscles and bones that you wanna strengthen and, and stretch throughout your session. So it's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Um, it's challenging at times because you have these goals in your head that you want to do, and then the child's like, I don't want to do it. And you're like, all right, well, we got 30 minutes, so we got to do something. <laughs> so you just have to be energetic and fun and bubbly and just really try to get these children to, to move and play with you to, so they can achieve their goals. I have seen children for a month and I've seen children for three, four years straight. So it really varies. You have built really nice reports with these kids and their families throughout the years. Um, and the parents, like, once you discharge them, they'll come back a year later, or they, you know, there's a new problem. We want to see Lucy again because the child works so well. So it's really nice to see that year after year. Awesome. Um, can we have a quick introduction for you? Yes. Um, maybe describe, uh, how, what you do uh, day to day, what your job title is. Okay, love to get to know you. Great. Hi, my name is Rochelle Archer, and I work at the Monarch School. Yeah. Are you guys familiar with the Monarch School? It's a school for youth impacted by homelessness here in San Diego. Um, and I have two job titles uh, because I'm kind of transitioning from one job to another. But the one that you guys have featured here is I'm an expressive arts specialist. So uh, my background is in social work and expressive arts therapy. I have a master's in expressive arts therapy. And in that job, what I do is I oversee a team of arts-based therapists who work with youth and parents at the school. And so what we do is we provide individual therapy, we provide small groups, and also classes for students. And what we really found is that the arts are such a helpful way for kids who are dealing with a lot of stress and challenge to connect, to heal, to make friends, to feel safe and comfortable in school. And so um, our therapists work with kids individually. They do small groups. They do classes. They also do after school programming and parent groups. I mean, I oversee all of that and coach them in what they do. 
since I'm one of the founding members of the school, I've been there for over 20 years. Another part of my job is also training and coaching a lot of the other staff and volunteers and mentors who interact with our kids and what are the best ways to interact with youth that have experienced a lot of stress, a lot of trauma, maybe some challenges of poverty that folks who are volunteering or working with youth don't understand. And it's my job to make sure everybody's kind of using the same approaches and the same philosophy so we can be really effective and make school a really safe and powerful learning place for them. Awesome. All right. So for everyone, how did you choose to get into your field? How much did your college major affect your career choice? <coughs> uh, you can start. <laughs> you don't have to go on the line. Oh, okay. have to answer. <laughs> um, for me, it started um, when I was uh, getting my bachelor's degree in social work at San Diego State. I had to volunteer. I had to do like 40 hours of volunteering in my first year there, and I ended up volunteering at a shelter for teens. And that's where I really discovered that I, I really fell in love with those kids and really wanted to work with them. And the agency I volunteered for really liked me, and they hired me. And then it just kind of went from there. I was also someone who was always interested in the arts and found that that worked really well with kids. And so when I found an arts-based therapy program, that was the, the perfect fit for me. I guess being an athlete, I always um, envisioned working in sports someday. And then I got my degree in business and figured combine the two and, and find a career that's in sports and sports marketing. Um, I kind of fell into the role at the Chargers um, in corporate sponsorship. I remember at the time there's a couple of different opportunities and someone said if you're outgoing and you like different, your days are always completely different because you're talking to all different brands. We work with beer companies, and casinos, and you name it, any type of business. Um, they thought it would be a good fit and so I did that for, for 10 years and then kind of fell into a job at Fox Sports for the Aztecs, selling sponsorships there and then evolved into my, my latter role. So I guess being an athlete and being in business, um, just combined the two and that's kind of how I fell into my career. Yeah, uh, how I found my career, you know, growing up, ranching and whatnot, uh, you have to be really familiar with the flora and fauna, so your vegetation and wildlife, and it really catches your interest when you're out there in open range, too, if you're moving open range cattle, and I'm also an outdoorsman, so I um, grew up hunting, fishing, and trapping, and, you know, it's just, it catches your eye, and you're, you really appreciate nature when it comes down to it, and my parents always, you know, said, go outside, you know, don't sit in front of a TV. They had one TV, but I never watched it. Uh, they actually had to force me to come inside. And uh, college, you know, I uh, went to Kent State University, so up in Northeast Ohio, and I majored in wildlife biology. So luckily at a young age, I knew exactly what I wanted to do for my career, and I'm actually looking uh, to get my master's at Humboldt State University, specifically working with mountain lions around the state of California. So, yeah. I'm I'm the least linear person up here. Um, I when I was in high school, one thing was clear was that I did not like sciences, and sciences did not like me at all. Um, so I pretty much went out searching for a degree that didn't have any science. So I went into recreation, and it was really easy because I I was pretty much the kind of person that worked in summer camps during summer, like between you know between the school year time. And so I literally was looking for something where I could have a full-time summer camp type of life. That was all I wanted to do. Uh, so recreation leadership was the perfect field for me. Um, but I've just, I've been literally all over the map. I, I organized youth empowerment, uh, student empowerment organizations. I've organized, like I mentioned before, festivals, events, games. I organized the first uh, French-Canadian Games, putting province against province. I was in career development. I trained teachers on career development tools. Um, I was d marketing director for a magazine in Canada, so I toured everywhere in Canada to promote that magazine for high school kids. Um, and then the race car industry and working with the roller derby team. I mean, I've been everywhere. I've done everything. I've never been a firefighter. I might try to do that next. But um, I, I, I think like the difference between what your career is going to look like and what your parents' or your grandparents' career looked like is back then you went into a field and you stayed in it. And like my dad, when he retired, it was from the same job. He literally had the exact same job with the government his entire life. 
My mom was a nurse. Her entire life, she was a nurse. You know, you don't you don't see that as much anymore. People fluctuate. So, don't think that whatever it is you're doing now, you're going to be doing that in the next 20 years. Just keep expanding and keep growing and keep trying different things and keep being open to all the different scenarios because you never know what opportunity is going to land on your lap. You might just end up in a sailboat cruising Mexico when actually when I was living on, you know, at Anchorages in Mexico, I was managing the social media for Oprah Winfrey and Deepak Chopra, their um, meditation programs. And I'm literally in Mexico in the jungle and I'm surrounded by five foot iguanas, you know. So you never know. Just have fun with whatever it is that life brings you. Um, when I was in high school, I started volunteering in the hospital because I knew healthcare was the direction I wanted to go. Um, so I had the opportunity to volunteer throughout the hospital in various um, floors, pediatric floors, burn units, um, orthopedic floors. Um, and then I ran into a, a physical therapist in the hospital and, you know, as a volunteer, you're really not doing anything, you're just observing, you, you don't really get to do any patient interaction. But one of the physical therapists there um, really took me under his wing and he exposed me to physical therapy. And I totally fell in love with it. The more I learned about it, the more I knew that that was the area I wanted to be in. Um, I'm very physically active. I work out every single day. I love the outdoors. So that was really important to me and I wanted to follow that with the patients. Um, so I went to school, I went to community college to do my undergraduate and get all the undergraduate work um, until I figured out which college I wanted to go to and um, all the, um, I met all the prerequisites. Um, so I ended up going to graduate school um, in New York as well. And then later on I got my doctorate um, in physical therapy. Um, but healthcare was always in my mind from very early on. I knew I didn't want to be a pediatrician, I didn't want to be a doctor, and I certainly didn't want to be a nurse. <laughs> but I ended up going to school just as long as a doctor, so you just never know. Um, you know, I was like, I don't want to be in school for 10 years. Well, I, probably, I ended up going to school for 10 years just to become a physical therapist, but I absolutely love it. And what's great about um, this area is that there's now specialties that you can get certified in. So there's a pediatric specialist certification um, that I will be working towards as well, um, but there's one for every other area of physical therapy. All right, um, piggybacking off the undergrad thing, so do you guys believe that your undergraduate like prepared you for your profession in any way? For me it did, um, because I had to take all the sciences before, I had to take the bio and the um, anatomy and physiology and the chemistry and the physics and all those classes and it definitely prepared me um, for graduate school and made um, the classes in, in graduate school a little bit more comprehensible. Not easier, but comprehensible. I think the best way it helped me is it taught me to think. It, it, um, it taught me to think, it taught me to problem solve, it taught me to work in a team. You know those dreaded team projects and you're like, darn it, I don't want to be with so-and-so who never does any of the work and we share the grade. Um, but it, te it, it, it teaches you teamwork, it teaches you to solve problems as a team. Um, and those are really the most critical things that I've learned that my, my bachelor degree has, has given me is, you know, all that learning to think. Um, when you're, you know, when you have to write a paper, really spend your time preparing how are you going to write your paper. Your, know your conclusion before you even write your introduction. Know all your points, you know, how are you going to get there. And if you master that, then that is so helpful in your job because you're always you're writing emails you're writing reports you're writing documents um, those papers those essays they're they're your you know your map to your future um, and then like just how to get organized how to plan things all that stuff has really really helped me out of my career uh, but like I'm doing SEO in my job I didn't learn that in school that you learn that on the fly or so much stuff you learn on the fly like how to manage Google Documents and Google Suite and, you know, all the software that you use, that you learn that on the fly. Um, 
they're changing all the time. They're changing, yeah, they are, ch yeah, I know. <laughs> There's more change coming, but um, yeah. So, adaptation. <laughs> Yeah, uh, undergraduate uh, definitely helped me. Um, you know, I've always been comfortable working with others and whatnot, but uh, I did have some classes that I decided to take, so for like genetics, so I can do genetics work. But uh, I, it was pretty tough, you know, <laughs> let's just say to, to, to the least. Uh, it was very tough. My older sister was like, are you sure you want to take that course? And I was like, yeah, you know, I got to try it out, you know. Go beyond my comfort zone, and mm -hmm. that was something else. I kind of stayed away from at first when I, uh, you know, was working on my undergraduate. But uh, you know, it ended up paying off. So I'm able to do genetics work for our company when need be. But um, otherwise, you know, I've learned that working on your undergraduate can only provide you so much. Like it's in a classroom. So if you don't take courses where you're also exposed to like elements in the real world um that's where like an internship comes in possibly like in the summer so that does benefit you to a certain degree but uh i did gain a lot of experience in my field through internships during college which were paid luckily and there were free housing there was free housing um in addition to that you do get the network and in my field networking is a huge thing so i wouldn't have found out about this permanent position that i currently have um unless my one buddy who worked for them seasonally for six months and he let me know before I moved from Alaska down to here while I was working up there and uh, the week before he's like yeah you know this position open so you have to network with that and mm. I didn't know him until after undergraduate him and I were talking about how schooling helped us and then you know internships and seasonal work and I was seasonal at that time but it definitely exposes you to certain things that you won't be exposed to even in the real world. So my first experience, I should say, with like we conduct, I can conduct necropsies. So essentially, it's like dissections, of wild animals a lot to check out stomach contents and if there's any parasites or whatnot. And I'll send that in. Sometimes to different labs around the country. And undergraduate was my undergraduate degree. You know, I had a lab course, a bio lab course, where you had to do that. And a lot of people were like, "Oh, I don't want to touch this." And I was like, well, "I'm used to it." So I just was like, "This is what you got to do. You won't get blood all over you, or don't hit a vein or something, you know, or the bladder." But uh, <laughs> but it comes down to it. If you're in this field, you have to be very comfortable. Avoid the bladder. Stuff like that. Yeah. I guess my experience is totally different. Um, <laughs> I never have used. Yeah, no, I wasn't. Um, but no, I think you know, just to, to partly on what you have said too, like time management, learning that, and in your undergraduate, um, I've never done a complex calculus problem in sports, but um, it did teach me the ability to solve problems, which I think was helpful. And then, had I not got my undergraduate degree at San Diego State and found out there was a marketing internship while I was a student athlete, probably would have not uh, got my job with the Chargers, which then parlayed into Fox, which parlayed into my my current role. So. I definitely think the opportunities you get exposed to in your undergraduate are important, um, but I guess I wouldn't say I definitely took a class that really translated over. Um, it was through the internships and you know the networking, and I guess exactly what you guys have said of what you get the value of your undergraduate degree, specifically in, in my field. I got my undergrad in social work, and I feel like it just gave me such a great, solid foundation to come from for any kind of helping profession. You really learn about problem solving, you learn about what are the issues in the world and what are different ways of understanding those and it gave me a lot of, of just basic problem solving tools, ways to figure out like where are the resources and, and where to go for help um, and just kind of caring about the world and knowing how to move forward with that. Um, and then all of the other things that folks have said. Um, and I think all that practicum stuff that we have to do in the social work when we go to an internship was invaluable. And um, really, I still lean on some of the things that I learned in, in those settings for sure. Cool. Awesome. All right, well, we're going to open up at this point for any questions so far. And then feel free to yell it out.
can't pronounce your last name. But uh, traveling stories, um, is that like, um, I think there's one, or there's people that volunteer at the farmer's market. Is, is, is that when they read to the kids and they have all sorts of books? Okay. Yeah. I wanted to make sure that they were that. Yeah. Thank you. On to her, um, Mr. Andrews, um, what did you go, like, what did you want to study as a kid? Like, what specific animals did you want to learn about to be a wildlife biologist? Ooh, man, that's tough. Uh, I've lived in multiple places as a kid, so I grew up in East Texas. Um, lived in Northern Canada, too, so I had a vast, a very vast, you know, yeah. range of wildlife, but, uh, Probably have to say definitely bears at first, and I've done a lot of bear work. Um, but mountain lions is just, I have a connection with them. They're very <laughs> sneaky, let's just say that, to the least. And you know, being in the state of California, they're protected. Um, so there's a lot of additional work you can do. Compared to other states, the hunting, you can't hunt mountain lions, in, yeah. at least within California. But you can take them if you have a permit. So you have to go through the state, and it's usually ranchers, and I've had to deal with that and work through all that, which is unfortunate, but, you know, um, yeah, bears and mountain lions, and I've done wolf work, wolves, too. Wolves. I love working with wolves. <laughs> all right, maybe one more, and then you'll get a chance later. Anyone else? Okay. Can you share a little bit about um, founding the school? Nonprofit, and I think the biggest trend coming is fundraising. Um, so if, if you're a networker, if you love people, if you love reaching out to people, uh, definitely consider fundraising. That is, and, and I mean, it's probably similar to you in a way. Um, so just basically, like it can be 
fundraising events or it can be reaching out to you know one on one with with donors one time donors or major donors it can be uh, working with people to um, plan estates and legacies um, just overall anything fundraising related is definitely the a, a big wave of the future for the nonprofit industry I would say the sports industry is technology for sure. There's um, in sports sponsorships, companies are always wanting to find out their return on investment, and so we use analytics, a lot of programs to help show that return on investment. And so I feel if you wanted to get in sports, you want to be ahead of the curve. It's it's learning the technology that is out there and that brands are starting to use, and also teams are starting to use to evaluate those partnerships. I think in my field, definitely collaboration is a huge thing where. Um, people come together to really share their knowledge and their experience. Um, and when it comes to philanthropy, also having, it's really important for funders to give to programs and allow programs to do what they need to do with that money, rather than having a really big plan. A lot of times people who give have this like, I want to give to tango lessons for homeless youth. And it's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's the kind of stuff that we experience sometimes where it's really important to cultivate relationships with people who, who say, what do your kids need? Go do it. I want to support that and get behind that. Um, so that's, that's just educating people a little bit more on what really makes sense. Um, in my career, medicine is always changing, right? There's always research going on in different types of treatments and techniques and um, so that's always changing. That's something that, as a clinician, you have to stay on top of all the research, all the evidence, and um, implement it in your day to day. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to kind of piggyback off, uh, you know, the nonprofit, um, there definitely is a lot of grant proposals that end up writing. You know, I've written plenty. Grant writers. Yeah, and <laughs> that can be pretty tough. Um, but there is definitely an increase in our industry. You know, a lot of folks or employees, I should say, uh, within the environmental industry are up at an older age, so they're going to retire soon. So they're definitely looking for people a little younger to hire and whatnot. And even with the federal government, uh, which I've worked for for, yeah, like seven years. I've been a year with this nonprofit, but uh, I actually did write some grant proposals too for other organizations, especially like Grand Canyon National Park. I worked there. I wrote some for like Native Conservation Crews in Arizona for Native Americans on the uh, reservations and whatnot. But there's definitely going to be a lot of jobs opening up soon, and if you can get any experience you can, you definitely have to take that opportunity when you can get it because it's very it's very tough industry. Um, I'm only 27 and I'm lucky to be in the position I am, but yeah, there's a lot of folks here still, even in their 40s, working seasonally six months out of the year and looking for another job, you know, after, even right when they get hired for that position. So. Um, I was wondering if you guys could briefly describe some of like the highs and the lows, like some of the most rewarding aspects of your career, maybe some of the like most challenging. For me, it's working. Um, I work for a nonprofit organization as well, so we do work with a lot of the underserved, low-income families. Um, so just learning about their background. A lot of them come from uh, traumatic uh, households, um, homelessness. Um, so that it becomes a challenge because there's a psychosocial component that prevents the child from, or actually the family, from moving forward and, and achieving their goals. So that's one of the downfalls of where I'm at right now. But at the end, it's very rewarding because we have a huge support system implemented in our organization. Um, so, and there's a lot of opportunities for the families to connect with different resources. Uh, for, <laughs> uh, for my career, uh, you know, um, at least with the rewarding side, you know, I get to educate people on uh, the natural world and whatnot. A lot of people are unfamiliar with uh, how the politics actually have a big impact upon it. And not just that, um, 
you have to go through them. It's a it's a huge process just to set a certain law or certain laws, you know, or just to do any type of research. And especially in this state, it is very strict, um, you know, to do certain work. So, like with certain species, we'll use drugs such as ketamine to tranquilize them, just so you're safe. And in order to get that, that is a long process. Um, but it it is great, you know, working on a variety of species. It's not just large mammals or whatnot, but uh, avian species. I've done herpetology work. Um, but the downfall, I have to say, is uh, if you get out of shape, even for like a month, <laughs> woo, yeah, you're going to be paying for it because a lot of times I'll put in 20 miles a day backpacking somewhere for work. Wow. That's awesome. Yep. And the next day, 20 miles out. So. With um, the wildfires in California and some of the climate change stuff, do you notice any like changes in patterns of animals and the research that you're doing? Uh, I don't do too much, at least in what do you call it, like, LA area, east of there, I guess, like Big Bear, Riverside. But Northern California, they definitely we do have some problems, like more interactions between um, you know the wildlife and the residents and whatnot. But at least in Northern California, you know, they're used to the wildlife. There's a lot of outdoorsy people up there. So it's not much of a cause except, you know, bears get flushed and cattle kind of yeah, disappear. So oh, yeah. That's a whole nother whole nother problem. Yeah. I guess uh, most rewarding for me is when we tie with nonprofits. Um, we've done a lot for wounded warriors or um, had make a wish kids on the field at Charger Games. And so for me, that's the most, um, I guess, best part of uh, my job. Um, I did go through like a team leaving, so I'd say that was probably the worst part of my job. Um, go through that process and, you know, announcing, seeing it being announced on Twitter the night before and then having an idea that the team was most likely relocating. But you know, I'd been there 10 years, there'd been a lot of staff that had been there 30 some years. So um, we were all offered jobs to move up to LA, but for a lot of us it didn't make sense. And so it was an interesting time. I know it sounds kind of superficial compared to what you guys are all doing out here, but um, it, was a, it was an interesting time in my career for sure. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to obviously the new stadium for the Aztecs and hopefully what that will do for San Diego and San Diego State. So, same. Are you still a Chargers fan? Um, I watched them. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
achieving the goal that they really thought they never could, and then seeing them go on to college and really being able to be successful and break that cycle that they're in of, of poverty and homelessness is just nothing like it. It's mm -hmm. so rewarding. Um, and I mean, that's like a really big high, but just on a daily basis, seeing kids being excited about being at school and connecting with adults, kids who, when they came in, were clearly hurting and didn't want to talk to anybody, didn't feel safe, seeing them kind of come out of their shell is super exciting. Um, I think the challenge is when we have students that are just so hard to reach and that just it just doesn't feel like anything we do kind of makes a difference for them or they, they disappear or they just have so many challenges that they're not able to be successful. That's really, really hard. And I think another thing that's really hard for me coming from a, a therapy background is I feel like I have this understanding that kids need to feel safe and they need to have their emotions and their basic needs met before they can be in class before they can really study if they're hungry or if they're worried about something that happened last night. So sometimes there's a little bit of a conflict between what the work that we do and the work of like the teachers because they're like, get in here and do your work and come on and the kids like crying or having a really hard time and so my work has been a lot of like teaching them to create like a healthy safe space in the classroom so that they can start there and then kids can learn. But it doesn't always easily go together. I have a list. <laughs> I, I actually prepared a list of skills, and it's not just my occupation. I think it's a skill set for any job, any industry, any occupation. Um, and I'd say the first one is, is the attitude. Um, that I got this, I can do this attitude, that is so essential in any, any job. Um, a clean vocabulary, if, I used to cuss like a sailor, um, and I've cleaned that up, and it's important to clean it up, and it's, it's even with your friends on the street, it's, it's, it's just not, it's, it's not really cool. You think it's cool, it, it, it isn't, and it's just like, it's a good habit to crack and stop. Because every time you drop a net, drop an F-bomb, you're literally taking the power of your word away. And, and when you have, sometimes all you have is your word. So if you take it away by having, you know, an unclean language, you, you, you lose even that. Um, your integrity. Integrity is, is a major skill. And by integrity, I mean doing what you said you would do. And if you realize you can't do it, then, then catch up in time and say, hey, I said I was going to do that. It's not going to happen. And it doesn't really need to be why, but just it's not going to happen, and this is what I'm going to do instead. You know, so keep your integrity in check. Um, your mindset. Who are you? What are you when you're facing fear? And what is your mindset when it comes to a challenge? Are you the kind who says, oh, no, there's a mountain. We're just not going to do it. Imagine Lewis and Clark, when they climbed up the first mountain, they thought they made it. And then they get to the summit and they realize there's like hundreds and hundreds more mountains. No wonder one of them got so sick. He was like, I, I can't, I can't do this. And they had a pregnant woman guide them through that. She gave birth and one of them fell sick. And all the credit goes to those two white guys. But anyways, um, <laughs> self-confidence. You know, Muhammad Ali, his slogan, I am the greatest. Borrow that. Try it for a while. See if it fits. But the self-confidence, and it's okay to fake it till you make it, because it will come to you. If you don't have it right now, just keep faking it. It will come to you. You will build that self-confidence. Um, like I mentioned before, the thinking skills, um, the capacity to think, the capacity to strategize. Don't just be a doer, because anybody can be a doer, but be a thinker. Plan it out. Think ahead. And, and look at... If someone is asking you, I want you to do this, just think of, think like the domino effect. Where is that going to go? What, what's it for? And you know what? If we do that instead, maybe we'll get that result. I'm sure a boss would much prefer that to just someone who's like a little sheep and following the patch. Um, excellence. Always, always, always seek excellence. That just good enough criteria is not good enough. Just see if you can surpass yourself. See if you can go a little bit further. Um, the capacity to embrace, embrace change. 
change is always, always going to happen. Like I said, you know, I learned SEO and Google on the fly, and she was like, and it, it, it's not over. It's, it's not over. It's never over. You're always going to need to learn new, new skills, new strategies, new approaches, because everything is constant, constant, constantly changing. Embrace it. Don't fight it. You're going to be like that person who falls down the stairs and breaks every single bone instead of just rolling with it and getting back up and going, wow, that was kind of scary, but <laughs> I survived. Um, and then paying attention to detail. That's also a super good skill to have. And, and I learned that one as a race car mechanic. I went in that field. I had no idea what the, I had never even seen or heard of a sprint car. And I quickly became the best mechanic on the tour. Every single team was scouting me, trying to get me to work for them. Why? Because I had 0% failure. I had no, there is never a piece of a car that fell off when it was on the track, when it was under my, under my supervision. So pay attention to detail. Look for, don't just look for problems, but look for problems that might happen. Look for potential cracks and failures and see what can be done to fix them before cracks and failures happen. That was very well put. <laughs> 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 I love every area of life. Not just, you know, whatever career you go into. But no, that was very well put. Thank Thanks. I think what I would say, too, is, um, I don't know if this is a skill, but I think it's a strength that's really important, is to have a vision of, like, who are you and how, what do you want to do in the world? I remember when I was in my undergrad for social work, we had one of our professors was absent one day, and the advisor kind of came in, and she was asking all of us, oh, what do you want to do with the social work degree? People were talking about, you know, job different services or different things like that. And I was like, I want to do something with the arts and kids. And she kind of mocked me and was like, oh, well, let's just good luck getting you a job. <laughs> and it was so fun because last year I was invited to go back and speak at San Diego State in the education program, the master's level program, and be like, bam, here's the program that I made <laughs> for youth with the arts. And, and it just felt like this, like, booyah in her face. And so it's like, don't let other people diminish what your vision is or your goal. And you, there's a lot of ways to get where you want to go. And it may not always make sense to other people. So really following your own heart and following your own sniffer when it comes like, hmm, I think I want to do that. It may not make all the sense now. Um, and, and enrolling other people in that vision, getting them excited about what you want to do and getting them to support you. Um, and I really agree with the flexibility part. Being able to pivot, like doing something and then being like, oh, that's not working and changing gears quickly mm -hmm. and being flexible and, and finding solutions in a really creative way is one of the best things that's worked for me. So. All right, so what's the biggest risk you guys have had throughout your career or maybe even with like your undergrad or college? <laughs> Lions and tigers and I've had plenty, but um, I guess I can give a couple. Uh, working at Grand Canyon National Park, I uh, also helped out with the vegetation program with an endangered, endangered plant species. So I've never been a person that likes to repel. So. <laughs> I learned how to repel, so I actually dropped down in ropes in the Grand Canyon. I looked below me. I'm not afraid of heights, but I looked down. I was like, they said, trust the rope. So I was like, uh, trust the rope. It's like really thin. <laughs> but, you know, ended up getting that work done. In addition to that, uh, I actually crawled into bear dens while they're hibernating and oh, wow. tranquilized them, too. <laughs> I'm pretty I'm on the wild side at times, but uh, I guess with awesome. college and whatnot, uh, chemistry was a very <laughs> tough force for me. So, I mean, if no one's really, if you aren't into like science or whatnot or like anything along those lines, chemistry, you know, I was only required to take uh, the first course, but I decided to go above and beyond and take three courses. And... That taught me a, a very good lesson, you know, sometimes you just, you have to know your limits, but I did end up passing, so. 
Yeah, I'll keep it at that. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's nothing like that at all, but uh, it was, was a woman getting into sales. I was always under the vision that, you know, sales people were kind of sleazy sales people, and um, I've tried to carve my own path and figure out that a good salesperson is just someone that's curious, asks a lot of questions, and follows up. And so I've tried really hard to do that in my career and not focus on, you know, the annoying sales part of it, but just actually solving a problem. Um, and then if I focus on that, I've been successful so far in sales and I've kind of risen throughout the ranks there. So for me, it was it was taking a jump and just getting into sales and realizing I may be carving my own path and doing it a different way and being able to pivot and be flexible if the way you're going doesn't necessarily work. So I heard, highly encourage women, if you're thinking of getting into sales, it doesn't really matter gender, just... Um, but there's plenty of opportunities right now, and I think it's it's a great time, and there's a lot of um, mentors that you can find out there that can help you throughout your career, but I'm a big proponent of sales, and I'm getting into sales for sure. Awesome. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, I have one for um, When you say that you go like 20 miles hiking, or most of your job in general, do you visit it alone, or are you uh, it varies. Sometimes I'm solo. Uh, other times I could be with one person or ten people. A lot of times I'm by myself. Uh, there's only <laughs> one other uh, person based here in San Diego, and then he really he has a child with his his wife, so it's pretty busy with that. But I'm usually solo. So sometimes I snowshoe in, especially up north, you know, and. Mm -hmm. That could take over a day mm -hmm. just to get to that spot. Let someone know where you are just in case. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> they probably have a track wrong yeah, yeah, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how it usually is, or it's just your company that it's. A lot of, well, uh, it depends kind of the geography and like if you're in the federal or state or a nonprofit and the project. So. I've done federal, I've done 20 miles in a day. I worked in the Grand Tetons and Yellowstone, so one time I had 25 to 30 miles in a day by myself. And I ended up getting up to the Idaho border uh, next to Wyoming. And yeah, uh, it really depends on what projects you work on. So that one I was working on bighorn sheep and mountain goats. So it was high alpine and I was like shipping rock fields and whatnot. But I had a radio and a tracker on me, so that was a plus. But it, it comes day by day sometimes, you know. Sometimes I get called up north and I'll end up being like, oh, looking at a topographic map, I, map and I have to hike out. I'm like, oh, this is probably 10 to 15 miles, something like that, 20. And I'll see if I can get like a technician to come out, meet me out there, and then you know, have some backup. Yeah. Hey, Bears. Uh, this is another question for uh, Mr. Andrews. When you were working uh, in the Grand Canyon, did you have like direct contact with like the department, like for the national parks, or were you mostly working with like other biologists? Um, sometimes I worked with other biologists. Uh, my immediate boss, she also had a child who was two years old. Um. So she wasn't able to be out in the field often. And I ran uh, the bison program on the North Rim. So the North Rim of the Grand Canyon has bison. And I'd usually be solo by myself. Um, I'd only have radio, I'd have radio, but I can only contact them when I was at our headquarters up there. Otherwise, I'd be about 40 miles in the back country with livestock and I tranquilize bison and throw collars on them. But um, yeah, otherwise, sometimes when I go down into the canyon and do our work. Um, I actually trained up a few other technicians and that was a plus because they could also learn the, you know, the ropes and I wouldn't have to be out there by myself and you know, question myself. But um, yeah, that's a very <laughs> bad place to say the least. Not much communication and I did get an earful a few times from my media boss and I didn't have I couldn't find any signal on a radio, so. Wow. Anyone else? That's so cool. Uh, this question is nice. So, um, since you are a woman in like a sports industry, mm -hmm. have you ever encountered a moment or like a project where a male has felt like more superior? 
superior <laughs> You know, to be honest, it's the other it's been the other situation of like another female um, mm -hmm. feeling a little bit threatened. Um, but yeah, I mean I definitely am um, somewhat of a minority and, and especially in sports sales, there's not a ton of females. Um, I'm on the board of Wise It's Women in Sports and Events, and I try to help encourage other women to get into the industry and try to leave the, pave the way behind me. Um, but yeah, I guess to answer your question, it's only ever been a woman before. It actually hasn't been a man. And I feel like right now, if you know, um, it's, the, it's the right person for the job. It doesn't matter gender. It doesn't matter race. It's um, whoever should be in that role. And so I feel like there's tons of opportunities now for women, and um, I just think it's a great time for, for women in general to be executive role. I'll ask a question. Um, this goes to all of you guys. Um, do you guys have any good strategies for handling any stress and or anxiety produced by yourself? Being an expert on traumatic stress. Um, I have a daily meditation practice. So every morning I wake up and I meditate and I stretch my channel for about a half hour just to kind of like make sure I'm in like the best possible state. And when I leave the job, I do some things to make sure that I leave everything there. So I'm not taking it with me. Um, so when I, I have a son and, you know, when I get home, it's time for me to be there for my family and my friends. So shifting. Um, just having a really clear sense of like what are the things that I can control and what are the things that I can focusing on those and letting go of the stuff that I'm not able to, to control. Yeah, I go for a run. It's my big stress outlet. But um, And then I try to plan as much as I can. I work a lot of nights and weekends. I also have little children. I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. Um, I work a ton of hours, and so I just make sure that I'm over-prepared for everything the best I can. And then I try to eliminate decisions that aren't important. So like I lay out clothes the night before of what I wear. I pick my meals of what I'm going to eat figure out when I'm going to work out so that I can try to keep my mental clarity for the decisions that actually matter. So when I get to my job, I'm focused on the biggest parts of that day, not all the little things that add up to mental exhaustion, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I've been trying over the years to really hone in on that and work on that, because um, I feel that helps me be more successful and a better mother and a better employee as well. At least for my uh, job, you know, sometimes if I am stressed, I will actually, especially when I'm working with software, like our ArcGIS, um, I might be off, but sometimes I'll just, you know, just bug me. I can't figure something out, so I'll just continue to try to fix the problem myself. And I'll also talk to my boss, um, you know, so he's just like, man, you don't need to work. You've worked too much. I'm like, well, it's my off time, you know. It kind of interests me, but I like a challenge. And I also, you know, commit to my hobby. So even though I hike for work, sometimes I'll just drive out to East County, hike out there. I do have some of my horses out there, too, on a ranch. Sometimes I'll just go rope. Uh, I might drive out there, fish, and you know, listen to nature, play my guitars or whatnot. Uh, I just sometimes just think about life or don't think about anything. I just go for a drive. You know, it comes down to being simple, at least for me. So, keeping it simple. I I too have the daily meditation practice. I I start my day off with with a meditation and some journaling. I always go for. I live at the beach, so I. Every morning before work, I go for a walk at the beach. Sometimes I'll do a detour running longer on the beach to get to my gym, do a workout, detour through the beach again to, to get back home. During the day when I do get stressed out, I'll stop what I'm doing. I'll go out, take a walk, like a, just a 15-minute walk. And it's awesome when I'm doing that walk is when all the solutions come to me. Then I get back to my desk and I go to the computer and I try it out, boom, everything works and it's all, you know, everything works. Um, so stepping away from the problem and music, I, I play music at my computer. I have, and I very little sometimes be Emma Kirkby who's like an opera singer to some Eminem to <laughs> French music because I'm French and it's my language, but I, you know, a variety of music in that that keeps the stress away a lot. <laughs> what, how do you deal with stress at work? Oh, for myself, I do step away as well. Um, I go for a walk. Um, I try to take the tennis breaks that we get every, you know, twice a day. But 
rarely happens. <laughs> um, but when I am stressed out or something's not working out, um, I do step away from it, go for a walk outside, um, you know, just close my eyes for a little while and um, listen to music, and then things end up resolving. Awesome, thank you. Awesome. Um, I do have a quick question for you, Mr. Andrews. Um, so, like, it sounds like you probably had some intense situations, like, encountering wild animals. Mm -hmm. um, and this is probably, <laughs> <laughs> this is probably a weird question. Um, I'm from Humboldt County, and so I do have a question. Have you ever had any intense encounters with people living off grid? And how did you handle oh. that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I've had quite a few. Um, I actually had a problem. Should I talk about Humboldt County or Modoc County or do you want? Whatever you want. Uh, all right. Uh, well, I'll give you an instant. Oh, okay. In Wyoming, okay. In Wyoming, uh, actually, there's a rancher who has land right next to the Grand Teton National Park, and literally from his ranch, you can see all the mountain range, and he'll never sell that. But um, we usually call him, but he we tried to call him, he didn't pick up. So uh, me and a coworker went over there. And we we're not in on his property, we we're just right at his fence. And he has livestock as well. And we we're doing surveys uh, for avian species out there. And next thing you know, we hear a four wheeler coming out of nowhere from behind us. And we just heard, Ch -ch -ch. and we we're just like, all right, we put our hands up. So, you know, some people don't like you even being, even if you aren't on their property, they don't want you to be in the close proximity of it. So, you know, we simply talked to him. He's like, okay, wait, yeah, I remember you guys. And luckily the situation, you know, that worked out for us. But um, after that, you know, we didn't, like, we called him. We did not, and he didn't answer, you know, we didn't show up to his property. So I've had plenty more, but <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, okay, for everyone, if you, if you have to answer, um, but if you have earned a graduate degree, at what point did you know that you would pursue additional education? How did you know which program to pursue? I only have a bachelor's. Don't look at me. Yeah, I don't have a bachelor's. <laughs> <laughs> because our, the American Physical Therapy Association, their vision is to have everybody have a doctor, a doctorate in physical therapy. So um, when I started my undergrad, um, there were mainly bachelor degrees in physical therapy, um, and a few master's programs were starting, and then by the time I entered, it converted to a master's program, which then converted into a doctorate program. So. Um, I actually, after I graduated um, from with my master's, about a year later, my school reached out to all the graduates and offered us a transitional doctorate program, um, which was only was like nine or ten credits extra. So I jumped on it, and the majority was done online. So it was just a really easy decision for me. Now, when I decided to get my master's, I had been working with youth in the arts at the school for a long time and I just could see over and over how powerful it was to you and and I really wanted to explore that more deeply and I but I wanted to make sure that I was in a program that was not heavily psychology based but that was really arts based and really based in like working in creative ways with kids and so um, that's when I found the expressive arts program that I found um, and knew that that was the right fit and then I was also able to talk to the organization that I worked for into paying for that master's in exchange for like staying there forever, which is what I'm doing. All right, so now that you guys have like achieved like maybe your dreams, your career goals, and things like that, what's the advice that you give to like incoming students from high school or maybe people who are just trying to get their speed out for education? I have three for sure. Networking, mentorship, and internship. Um, even if you find a mentor in a career, and you may not end up in that career, anybody that has workplace experience can definitely help you um, and tell you maybe about that industry, and you can figure out if that's the industry you want to get into. They can help you along your career in terms of negotiating and taking different opportunities. Um, 
and networking for sure, you just never know when you may land a job and you may get that internship from networking. It's never too young to start. Um, highly recommend that, you know, right from the get-go. Um, yeah, and then internships, take advantage of that and make sure you get that real life and work experience that you can't replicate in school. Um, and then you never know when that leads you into a permanent position, which then kind of starts your career. Just a reminder, we're based on an internship coordinator, part of our team, right? Um, I would say volunteer. Volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. Every skill you earn as a volunteer is a completely applicable skill to any career. Um, and the other thing is mind yourself on social media. Um, when people hire you, they will look at your social media accounts. And if all they see you is you chugging the keg or whatever it is that you do that is, <laughs> um, it, I, keep it clean, you know. Um, fill out your LinkedIn profile. Even if it's a volunteer job, put a job description. And if there is no job description, whatever title you're given as a volunteer, go online, find a job description, and just plop it in there. Make sure it applies to what you do. But fill it up. And that way, people, employers can find you on social media, on, on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, and like you said, mentorship, internship, on all that. Just as many uh, opportunities as possible. And one of the questions that we skipped, because we're probably out of time, but um, get involved in your student organizations. I, I was campus director. The first job I got, she told me, the reason why I'm giving you this job is because you were campus director. You got elected on a position with your student association. Um, so be as involved as possible right now. This is where you, this is the place for making mistakes and for learning. Um, so take advantage of it fully. I would say don't worry too much about how long things are going to take. Like I was at community college for five years because I was so curious about so many different things. And I'm so glad I did all of those things. They were helpful to me. And there were people like, well, you should be out of here. You should be doing this. But you don't, there isn't a magical timeline for any of these things. All the experience counts. And it all adds up to yep. getting where you want to be. And if you need a little bit more time to explore those things, you're in the perfect place to do that. So take your time and explore the things that you're interested in. You'll, you'll find a way. No yeah. one will ever ask you in the interview how long it took you to get your degree. No. <laughs> no. And they don't ask for your grades either. Oh, yeah, <laughs> they won't ask your grades. They just want to know that you graduated. <laughs> <laughs> and that permanent record doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> You know, both my parents um, are Portuguese. Their highest level of education was fourth grade. So I really never had any guidance to go to school or they're like, you have to go to college, but you're on your own. We have no guidance. So I pretty much taught myself and I motivated myself to go to college because I knew I wanted to be in healthcare. But I had no, no idea. In high school, I was a pretty good student. I had good grades. So I thought my first year in community college, I was like, I'm going to take bio, and I'm going to take anatomy, and I'm going to take all these classes. I had like 18 credits, all science classes, and I bombed. And I had no idea you could drop them out, right? So my GPA went like this. Well, I had a counselor and uh, for pre-physical therapy, and she's like, you are never going to be a physical therapist with these grades. And I was like, devastated. So I was like, you know what? You don't get to tell me what to do. <laughs> I'm going to become a physical therapist, and it's going to take me a little bit longer. So I, I, um, I took less classes. I made sure I completed them, and I got A's across the board because it is a very competitive field. Um, I didn't go to physical therapy school initially. I went to physical therapy assistant school. I became an assistant, and then I went. I got. I finished the classes while working full time. Um, and then I went to graduate school on the weekends three years while I worked. So yes, it took me longer and that's why it took me 10 years. But that counselor <laughs> was the one who told me I was never gonna do it. Guess what, I'm here today. So don't let anybody tell you that um, you can't do something because your grades are this or that. If you're driven and you love what you wanna do, get it. Yeah, I was going to add, pick, choose a career you love. Yeah. 
it, it's going to carry you through on those harder days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yourself, knowing that you had such a day you did, and then decide, oh wait, I love what I'm, what I'm, what I'm volunteering, but do I really think I can do it? Absolutely, absolutely. Especially since you know my parents didn't go to school, they didn't go to college, they didn't go to high school. They had no idea. They just said, you know, we'll support you and, and we'll help you with whatever you can, we can. But they had, I had no educational guidance or mentorship, and that's why I really relied on that mentor. Um, at the hospital, that PT, um, that was huge. And you know, to piggyback on what everybody else said, volunteer and network with people because those are the people that are going to give you strength to move forward and get and do what you want. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to open it up for the last couple questions. We don't have much time left. But anybody has any questions? Uh, Miss Howard, did you ever think, uh, did it ever catch your mind that your job is for sure. Um, I get asked that question a lot, actually. Um, it's very rare to have a female doing what I'm doing, also with kids. Um, but for me, family first over everything, and I refuse to let that take a back seat. Um, but then I also, that being said, when I'm at work, I focus on work, and when I'm at home, I focus on my kids. And I try really hard to keep a distinction. Um, there's times it overlaps. I close the deal breastfeeding my daughter one time. Like there's been that situation that's happened. But I try really hard to set boundaries as well. Um, I mean, they hired me for a reason, so I try to remember that actually my family is an asset. When I'm in a meeting talking to a client, most of them have kids or you know have a family, and so it actually helps. Um, and I just try really hard to just focus on one when I'm there and focus on the other when I'm there. So. But to be honest, I mean, there's no such thing as work-life balance. It's just your <laughs> mindset and uh, attempting it, um, which I try to do every day. It's a struggle. Thank you. Thank you. Do you keep in contact with them at all or any of them? Um, the school has an alum association, so we have someone whose job it is to follow up with those kids and maintain relationship with them. I have a lot of kids that come back later and will connect with me on Facebook, like Facebook or Instagram, or will come by the school and talk. Um, so I do personally also have connections with kids that have come through, um, and it's always really cool to hear what they're up to. And sometimes it's not going great, but it's cool that they know how to you know, reach out and see. time for one probably last piece of advice or if you have know, a question you want to ask um, and then in the meantime if y'all can fill out this quick survey um, and your professor has an announcement after um, can I add a quickie we currently we're hiring we have a part-time weekend job so it's a perfect job for a student to run our, sto our story tents so come see me come grab my, my business card if you're interested in finding out more about it Any last pieces of advice for our students as they enter the workforce? I'd have fun too. I feel like there's yeah. a lot of pressure and stress trying to figure it all out. And I wish I would have had a little bit more fun in college. I was an athlete and I did internships and student athlete advisory committees and all these things, but I look back and I wish I would have actually enjoyed it a little bit more and had fun. So I guess that's my advice. Try not to be too stressed about it right now. You have time. You're on your own timetable. You don't need to follow anybody else's timetable. Just enjoy. I, I want to add every single skill you have is transferable. You know, it, it, say you start your program in computer programming and then you want to change and go to social working, well, everything you've learned in co computer programming, all those skills, they definitely apply to like social working. You know, like I'm, I, I, I'm with a nonprofit that manages story tents and I do SEO and design work and I'm pretty much building software and running a website. So it, everything is transferable. Don't think that you can't change or even your, your area of study. Well, you know, I'm halfway, I might as well finish it. If you change your mind, you change your mind, go into something else, follow your heart. Always follow your heart. It will be applicable. Definitely a 
<laughs> Learn to be uh, comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, this is the first city I've ever lived in in my life. So um, I grew up in plenty of rural places. And, you know, I knew it was a big, it was going to be a big change for me. And everyone's like, there's no way you're going to last there. Like, what? Well, I've been here for a year. You know, it's, it's not bad, but it's a great city. Definitely, I'd say, one of the best I've been in. I came here as a kid, but... Uh, just like, you know, don't be afraid of jumping in the deep end sometimes, you know. it. You might regret it later on if you don't, if you don't take that risk. And, you know, I'm glad I took that risk because I do like San Diego, surprisingly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.